Good morning. Um, apparently, there is a there's a heated race for the question, the most questions in the talk. Uh, so, <laughs> I don't know if I'm uh, I'm up for the record, but let's try. You can go go ahead and hit me with your questions. Um, this is the Champlain Mo uh, Center for the Unknown, uh, where where I work, and some of you have have visited. I hope. Some of you get a chance to visit in the future. Uh, next year, there'll be a neuroscience symposium in the autumn, probably in September. Keep an eye out for that. And of course, there are Cajal summer courses uh, that I should mention in the summer. Is anyone going to a Cajal course by any chance? No? Well, keep, keep an eye out. There are some promotional materials in the back. Okay, so, uh, so I want to talk about serotonin. Um, and a lot of everyone knows uh, a little bit about serotonin. And I want to start with uh, a little bit of pharmacology. Although, the, the, before I get into the pharmacology, I would say th this is, um, this is a, a, part of the, uh, a part of the topic that has always driven my interest in serotonin, but um, <laughs> it brings to mind a story uh, maybe 10 years ago when I was getting in intensely interested in serotonin. I had a conversation with a colleague uh, from, from Stanford, and I was telling him how what we would like to do is to understand in a circuit basis some of these pharmacological effects, some of these fascinating aspects of the effect of drugs uh, on the brain. And he said, don't do it. It's a... It's a complete uh, morass. You'll never come out of it alive. Uh, <laughs> um, perhaps there was some wisdom uh, in that, because you know, the problem of understanding uh, why, uh, wow, that's kind of interesting. The problem of understanding how and why drugs do what they do is, is generally uh, not a super simple one. It's a, it's a very different perspective from the perspective of uh, individual neurons talking to other individual neurons uh, via discrete synapses, millions and billions of them. Um, but for me, in a way, I think it's, it's actually maybe a more hopeful uh, aspect of systems neuroscience than the rest. Because to understand all the complexity of the thousand or so areas in, in a mouse or, or rat brain, and, and there's something like 500 areas on, on either side identified, and the billions of synapses, et cetera, it's, it's clearly a much more uh, daunting problem than understanding just uh, four major ascending neuromodulatory systems, which, well, you'll, as you'll see, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of uh, advocate the view that we could take a very simplifying approach and think of them as broadcasting simple, single-valued signals. Clearly, it should be easier to understand, in some sense, th these low-dimensional uh, signals than the enormous complexity of, of everything. We shall see. Uh, so let me, let me get back to serotonin. So serotonin is particularly well-known as a target of SSRIs, which are well-known uh, for the treatment of depression, but are also extremely uh, important in, in treating other types of uh, psychiatric conditions. Um, but then, well, or perhaps reinforcing to some degree the notion that serotonin might be involved somehow in, in, in mood is uh, this uh, drug, uh, MDMA, which also acts on the serotonin system in a slightly uh, different way and produces, uh, produces different sorts of effects, but you might start to, uh, well, I think in the public's mind at least, this reinforces the notion that serotonin has something to do with happiness. Now, it happens that the drug is slightly misnamed. Perhaps the effect ecstasy is not really an accurate description of what uh, this drug does. Um, so, but, but, but still, the happiness molecule starts to, starts to you know, come, come to mind, and perhaps uh, 
people could be forgiven for thinking that serotonin levels could be used to describe your positive or, or negative or negative mood. But then consider this drug, um, LSD-25, which is actually um, one of the things that got people originally interested in, in serotonin. And this drug belongs to a class of drugs, including psilocybin, which are known to be quite specific uh, serotonin uh, receptor agonists, and that definitely could not be described as happiness causing molecules. So perhaps uh, one could sort of wriggle around and say, well, happiness may be the overall function when these two are given, but here we're dissecting the system and we go receptor by receptor, and different receptors will produce different effects. So the constellation of, of effects, the, the net effect of serotonin, would include whatever it is that uh, LSD does perceptual changes, changes in cognition, et cetera, as part of uh, a whole thing. But altogether, now the picture is not particularly coherent. Um, is, there, is it going to make sense at all to think of one function associated with a molecule uh, with, with such uh, diverse effects? Should we just think in terms of receptors and forget the idea of an overall function of serotonin uh, at all? And I think from, from a pharmacological point of view, practically speaking, you might say, sure, we have drugs, we can target different receptors, why do we care what the overall system is doing? What we have to work with is different axes that uh, drugs provide us, and these are three, I don't know, interesting examples of what you can do. So I, I don't want to take away from the utility of pharmacology, the interest of pharmacology in and of itself, but for me, the fascination is, what do these things have to do with each other? Is there actually something in common that could be traced to the fact that they're all uh, somehow mimicking the actions of a single neurotransmitter system or neuromodulatory system? Is there maybe something we're missing? Is there an overarching uh, view that could somehow make sense of apparently diverse uh, pharmacological effects? Come on, one question. <laughs> Challenge me. Go ahead. Okay, it's all perfectly clear. So, okay, so this, so in my mind, as a, I, I will call myself a systems neuroscientist, not not a uh, neuropharmacologist, but as a systems neuroscientist, used to working with synapses, sometimes in brain slices and such reduced prep preparations. Um, this is the view of my, my, or the goals that, that, that we have in trying to understand these things. So first, we'd like to explain how various pharmacological effects relate to the endogenous effects of, of the system. So we, we'd, like to, to, we'd like an account, an explanation that says, well, serotonin's real role in the brain is, is X, and we can then understand why drugs that interfere with that function uh, produce diverse uh, effects that are not necessarily exactly the same as this putative and endogenous function. And, and say, we think about dopamine, that, that makes some sense, I think. We think about serotonin, as we'll see, it's, it's a bit more confusing. Uh, second point is, we would like an explanation that would be in terms of the dynamics of the components of the nervous system, the, the, the circuits of the brain. Ultimately, we would like to link the firing of neuromodulatory neurons, in this case in the dorsal raphe or other parts of the, the, the raphe nuclei in the brain stem, to their effects on circuits in their target regions, be they in the cortex, in the hypothalamus, uh, et cetera. Um, and, yeah, and let's say third, because those targets at least are very complicated, uh, it's likely that we will need some type of computational models ultimately in order to make sense of all of that. Um, I'm not actually going to talk about computational models in much detail, but that sort of thinking is, is behind what I think is going to be necessary uh, to, to, to 
to understand these systems at, at some point or another. And I will talk a little bit about models, much as Russian talked about um, models th throughout her talk. So if you're not a computational person, fear not, I will, I will not show equations. At the very end, if you want, I have one slightly more computational uh, slide. So if you are interested, how, how, many, how many people have some sort of computational background or interest? Few. Good. Nice. Okay. <laughs> Actually, just by show of hands, how many, pe how many people would call it, would, how many people um, work with, m uh, say, mice or rats or some other animal model? Wow, okay. And how many with humans and not with animals? And of the humans, how many don't work with ra rats and mice? Okay. So actually, I got the impression it was the other way around. But so most of you are, most of you are with me in the, the little creatures. Um, okay, so, so a little bit more about um, how, how uh, I've chosen to look at, at things. And this is admittedly a simplifying way of looking at, at, at neuromodulators, but sort of broad, broadly, uh, we could think of them as a, a, probably Trevor discussed some of this or contradicted some of this during the introduction, <laughs> but to, so to reiterate or to, to uh, challenge that, um, like the, so the brain has a wiring problem. Uh, there are many parts of it, and I don't know if you've ever heard the, this um, explained, but you couldn't possibly wire every bit of the brain to every other bit. It would, it would require too many wires. The brain's volume would, would explode. So it, you can't. So, so things have to be organized in a way that, that connectivity is primarily local. You have to choose very carefully uh, which things are connected to which others. At the same time, it would be really useful, clearly, for some parts of the brain to be able to talk to all other parts of the brain. Um, in computers, there are uh, buses that, that, that can send signals to large parts of the computer chip. Um, so neuromodulatory systems, the ones that we're studying here in, in this course, are unique or or not, let's say, there are not really just four, but they're relatively unique uh, ways of sending signals from a small region in the brain, a nucleus in some cases, or a small, relatively compact group of cells, has some kind of information which it gets to broadcast to pretty much uh, every other part of the brain that it wants to. And it does that by sending very long axons, almost like a so-called sprinkler system, um, to, to uh, many, many uh, other regions of the brain. In the case of serotonin, both the forebrain and the hindbrain, um, 11 or so different nuclei, which could all talk to each other. Uh, so serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, acetylcholine, they're super interesting because of that property, because unlike almost every other region in the brain, which cannot talk to anything more than a few selected partners, neuromodulatory systems can talk to pretty much everyone and can do that very quickly. So it's, it's not just that they can bathe the brain in a certain signal that goes up and down very slowly. They, they can also send, and as you'll see, you've probably heard, and, and I'll, I'll show you some examples, they can send signals on the same time scale as any other neuron can send a signal to, to its neighbors. So on the time scale of tens of milliseconds or, or perhaps even less. So that's, that's quite important. And, and uh, I think that's key to understanding or thinking about how these systems work. And that raises a little bit of a problem for pharmacology because almost all the tools that, that we have don't work on that time scale. So when we're talking about agonists, antagonists, reuptake inhibitors, et cetera, we're, we're now working on the time scale of minutes, not on the time scale of milliseconds. So to understand the, the rapid nature of communication by neuromodulators, we need different tools uh, to, to, to access that. Uh, well, 
I'll spend, yeah, you'll see that throughout my talk. So uh, as examples of, of, of um, you'll, you'll see it come up. But, uh, but mechanistically, yes, there are receptors that are relatively slow, but you know, phototransduction in the eye is also based on receptors, processes that are intrinsically on the same time scale. They're quite slow, yet vision is not particularly slow. So it's a mistake to conflate the kinetics of G-protein coupled receptors with the system being very slow, um, et cetera. So it isn't a conundrum. I don't think there's any particular conundrum of why they can be fast. And as, you'll, as you know for dopamine, for example, uh, when a reward prediction error happens, dopamine neurons signal that on the time scale of tens or hundreds of milliseconds, not on the time scale of, of seconds or, or minutes. That, that doesn't deny that there are, that there may also be additionally long-term changes that are also important, and they may be complementary or uh, distinct. So I'm not, not saying there are not also important things going on at slower time scales, but uh, I think it's important sort of design feature of these systems that they're not hormones. They're not just dumped into the brain in general. They are uh, there is some specificity, so we'll get a little, I, I'm not going to get so much into specificity of pathways, but that's also true. They're not really necessarily one to all signals, but, but it's very clear that they can signal things quite rapidly. So for perhaps in some cases it's mainly through a particular receptor subtype, but, but the, I don't think there's any doubt about that at this point. Just a comparison of RFOs and names on Thomas Reedus showed a degree of compartmentalization in numbers as well as compartmentalization. They can see that all kinds of hypotheses. So the serotonin systems are literally in that North Slam media like that. And then already provides a degree of compartmentalization. Yes, for sure. But is the further compartmentalization in the graphic data degree as well? Yes. When I give this talk, typically, at this point, when I'm describing, I'll say, the next thing I'll say is that, uh, that, that the way to think of this is a very low dimensional signal. So instead, if there's 10,000 neurons, instead of each neuron wanting to say something different, they're all cooperating in order to say more or less one thing very precisely. That, that's a view. <laughs> I don't think it's 100% correct, but I think it's in that direction. To, this is a u the useful way to think of it. If you wanted to, uh, you could certainly get more precise. And every, as I say, every time I give this talk in a certain type of audience, everyone wants to know what is the more specific, you know, let, let's forget about this global signal. Let's talk about the signal going to eat, you know, why couldn't there be a loop between the prefrontal cortex and the RAF A? Why couldn't there be, you know, a specific projection to the amygdala, et cetera, et cetera? And, the, the, and I'm sure that is true to some degree. There's, there's enough evidence that there is anatomical uh, specificity to some degree. I just tend to think that that is sort of the, um, you know, it's, the, the, it's not the first order story, it's the second order story. So we should try to understand the first order story, which is that it's a general signal. Especially if we think in terms of pharmacology, we're not, we're, we're not, well, we're trying to explain a, a more or less global effect. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of contradictions and, and simplifications that, that we can make, and I'm giving you my bias in how to, how to start thinking about these things. It's also the bias, I mean, that say, say that uh, I'll get into some, I'll mention as Russian did some modeling work, it's, a, it's an assumption that was brought to the table by uh, reinforcement learning uh, theorists thinking about uh, what role neuromodulators could play in the process of reinforcement learning. And they saw the need for systems that could broadcast signals like this, that could, say, change key parameters in networks. So say if each synapse or each neuron has some tunability, say excitability or synaptic plasticity, then a neuromodulator could turn that knob uh, in all neurons simultaneously. Um, 
okay, f broadcast regulatory system, rapid, wide broadcast, low dimensional signal, and well, because there are few such knobs, they, they should probably be associated with a few important functions where a brain may need to uh, switch back and forth between s states. So, so they should be things which are, which are relevant to the, uh, to, to the behavior of the animal in, in some global sense. And we think about things like uh, attention, motivation, learning, um, you know, but what really are those uh, functions? Are, are the words or concepts of attention or motivation or learning the, the right ways to carve up the system or, or, or not? So there's a lot of attempt to match neuromodulators with different functions, the functions we've generally known about, and then we thought, ah, attention, okay, let's see if that could be uniquely mapped to this system, or let's say plasticity, could we map it to that system? And I think that view is, well, kind of the only one we have, but I don't think too many people would be very confident that we've got the right set of mappings. So, so that's partly the story I want to tell about serotonin is, I'm not going to be introducing crazy new ideas about what types of things it might be doing, but I'm going to question some of what I think people have generally been assuming is, are, its, are its primary uh, labels. So I, I think a lot of what's going on in this course you'll see is people finding that different neuromodulators all impact some of these uh, functions to some degree. So um, it, it remains to be seen, I think, what, what the, the whole landscape will look like when we know more. For example, if we ever had a set of recordings with, say, all four of these systems uh, in the same experiment, in the same lab, manipulated or, or, or measured, we might see a lot more clearly whether they do or don't have different functions. Mostly we're faced with data where one lab does one test and, and on one neuromodulator and another lab does another test on another neuromodulator and they conclude that the, the tests are associated with the modulators and not with the labs. And I think oftentimes that, that isn't a fair conclusion. <laughs> but as we were discussing, we were discussing last night, uh, I was discussing with, um, who, was, who were we discussing? That this is more of a publication, I think it was with John, this is more of a publication issue. Be careful if you put too many neuromodulators in one publication because you're sure to annoy at least one reviewer who studies one of those. So the, the less you put in, the, the better off you are. <laughs> uh, so, so given all this, um, and particularly given the, the the, the need to, to try to study things at a rapid time scale and with neurochemical or, or uh, genetic specificity, the advent of, of optogenetics is quite important, I think, for, for this field. Even though, in a way, you could see from the side of drug development or using things in humans, not immediately obvious why it's so interesting or important, but certainly for making the bridge between these fast time scales and neurochemical transmission, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a revolution. So before this, we, we couldn't reliably identify the neurons um, or manipulate them with, say, electrical stimulation because they're intermingled with other neurons with different neurochemical identities. Or, and with pharmacology, we have great specificity, but for time resolution, so optogenetics gives uh, finally a handle on uh, how to manipulate specific neuromodulatory systems with rapid uh, time scales. So, so it's, it opens up uh, new possibilities for experiments which uh, will test or refute, you know, will refute or support some of the previous ideas we had. Um, so so this, this came around sometime a little few years after we got interested in, in, in the system and and has been a lot of the focus of the work in my lab is, is using these optogenetic tools, uh, mostly in mice, to, to dissect the serotonin system. So, um, okay, so I'm gonna try to d address two, two different topics uh, in, in this talk. So one is how does serotonin release impact behavior, and the other is what events drive serotonin neurons 
to release serotonin endogenously. Um, so with the first, uh, that's, that's sort of an intervention experiment on a rapid time scale. And I'm not going to talk about the circuits that, presume, that must mediate those effects. We're going to just be stimulating neurons in the brain and then looking at behavioral effects. So we're, we're of course, interested in understanding how those behavioral effects come about be, by the circuits that are, that are being affected, but um, we're less far in that. And particularly in serotonin, that line of work is not very well developed. Um, actually, it's, it's sort of underdeveloped, I think, for all, for all the neuromodulators, and it's, it's very important. Uh, so it's not, not to be left out because I don't think it's important, but because I have less to say about it. If, if for some reason we get, I get through this quicker than I thought, I have was one study we published, uh, I think, last year that does deal with that issue. So if you're particularly interested in, in that, you could uh, remember and, and ask me toward the end. And then this second point is something that um, I think is extremely, extremely important. The famous slide that I'll show soon from Wolfram Schultz is, a, is a, the hallmark example of getting some kind of insight into what a system does by looking at what it's endogenously being driven by. And for serotonin, there, there has been precious few uh, recordings of, of the system, and, and up till fairly recently, they were very confusing. And I think there's, there's, still not, there's still a lot to be done, but I think we're starting to get some interesting clues from, from that kind of work. So, hope, so uh, first part, I'll talk about this first issue, and then maybe after, hopefully after the break, we'll get into this second uh, issue. I am really losing on the question thing. <laughs> okay. Okay, so what kind of, so we're talking about neuromodulatory effects on behavior. So uh, um, I think we can, we could, generally speaking, I like to think of two very different classes of, of effects. And the first is, uh, I would call a, a kind of learning effect. So by learning, in this case, I just mean effects that are accumulated over repeated exposure although, of course, there are forms of learning that, that don't require repeated exposure, but nevertheless, um, that result in a persistent change in behavior. So by example, this is a sort of thing I mean by a, a learning effect. So th this is called real-time um, place preference conditioning. So this is an optogenetic experiment with mice. When the mouse enters this box, the uh, light is turned on, and Neurons are stimulated, and the experiment goes like this. This is the baseline. The mouse runs around throughout the box. Here, the uh, light is turned on, and lo and behold, the mouse starts confining itself to this central quadrant where the light is on. This is three sessions over three days, and you can see this is the heat map of the occupancy uh, in these areas. And then on the last day, the light is no longer present, but the mouse persists in, in running around in this little bit of the box. So this is you know, some kind of accumulation over, I don't know, minutes and, and uh, days even, and a persistence uh, to the next day. Um, this is what you would expect from, uh, or, or has been done many times now, I think, with uh, the dopamine system. But this actually happens to be a study from uh, the lab of Min Min Lo, and this is a serotonin uh, system, in fact. So they, they had targeted the dorsal raphe using the PET1 promoter. <laughs> <laughs> How long does it maintain? Yes. This, this effect, uh, they, well, they, as far as I know, they showed only this one day, but I may be forgetting. But it, it seems to last days, or at least, at, least, um, at least on the order of days. Do they compare it with media, right? No. 
No, but just before we get too far into it, let me, uh, let me, <laughs> let me, let me try to, <laughs> let me give you my take on this experiment. <laughs> Actually, we, it turned out a bunch of groups were, have been working on some of these experiments kind of simultaneously or almost simultaneously. So this came out when we were partway, now I even forget where, what we had done at the time it came out, but it sort of surprised us because we had been working on similar types of experiments and uh, had not seen anything like this. So we were a little bit, um, we were a little bit surprised. Um, furthermore, as Russian described, it was also a bit strange. Well, <laughs> on the one hand, hey, actually, it, it, it's like the feel-good molecule of SSRIs, MDMA. It all makes sense, reward, pleasure. Um, you know, so in some sense, I think they thought, well, this makes perfect sense. But if you knew anything about the serotonin literature, didn't, it was totally surprising, didn't make any sense, because serotonin, in the, unlike in the public mind, in the laboratory, has long been associated with things like aversive responding. So this is one of the uh, well-known reviews where they propose a central idea is that brain serotonin systems are concerned with adaptive responses to aversive events. So the way they phrase it is a little bit different, but you could read this as, well, if, if serotonin is going to cause adaptive responses to aversive events, then what it signals must be an aversive event. Or, I don't know, I guess you could twist it around, but then it's a pretty weak theory. But if it, if it has to do with conveying aversive events so the brain can adapt to them, then signaling it should have the consequences of signaling an aversive event. And why would a signaling of an aversive event cause an animal to, to, to like to repeat that signal? It makes no sense at all. So it seems to directly contradict this line of thinking. And, but, you know, it's optogenetic stimulation. Maybe there's explanations. You know, it's not, you know, that, that's not in principle a reason for, for saying this experiment can't be true. But it does, but it is hard to reconcile with, with much of what we had known. But what about the idea that it might signal some kind of safety? So if, if it's triggered by, it's related by to the negative event, as a positive thing with respect to the baseline that then is set by the... Yeah, so that, exactly. So you can, you can exactly. So the problem with most of these theories, including the ones that I'm going to advocate, are that they can be too easily twisted into obtaining the opposite predictions than what you would initially have thought. And I think th that's a good example of, of, of why this theory is too easily escaping from potential falsification, because you could say, ah, oh, yeah, but what we meant is, mm. I, I, and I, 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 you're going to see some of the same problems with, I, you may notice some of the same problems with some theories that I'll advocate as ones that I oppose, but I think that's a general problem, but anyway, that, but that's not, that is what it, I mean, this ultimately is an experimental question, too, is, well, is this effect, a reproducible, robust, what is, you know, is it really true? That's another question. So that's what we were actually interested in is, is, is this really actually serotonin and is this really happening? So, uh, could you, maybe it's just me, but, but I just don't know how to interpret this uh, behavior. For me, it just looks like it's random and now it's in, they're just walking, he's just walking in the middle. So yeah. Well, what, what's the meaning of this? Um, yeah, that's actually, uh, that's actually a good question. I, I think the way it's supposed to be uh, interpreted is that the animal, well, it's called kind of a place preference learning or conditioning. So if you did this with dopamine, you would see a very similar thing. Pro perhaps someone has even done this. Has anyone done this experiment with dopamine? Okay, what, what would you see? Does it look like this, more or less? And how would you interpret it? Uh, Your experiment, not this experiment. Uh, maybe I would like the stimulation. I don't know. Anyone else that did this experiment have their own interpretation? What do you think? Oh, yeah, it was just the rewarding, and that's why they stayed in the compartment. Because, because it, they like it, because it's rewarding. And how about you? Right. I'm not doing that kind of experiments, but in my opinion, I think that, that mice will just have less fear, and that's why she's going to the center and explore center. Mm. 
but it's uh, mm. I'm not doing the, the, this method. Mm. But maybe activation of some compartments of serotonin in the system uh, might decrease fear and uh, mm. and make animals brave. And maybe because uh, when LSD users, I think mostly thinks more brave or after MDMA, mm. so, mm. so maybe. But it's. Hmm. But is the question, because you asked the original question, is our... Mine was is more basic, but then now I got the... I got the <laughs> yeah? yeah? But, but it's not... I just, I just didn't realize we're only stimulated inside the square. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So that's, that's, that's the... I'm sorry, the, okay, the, yeah. 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 But the question, you know, what does it mean for something to be rewarding? Uh, Generally, the, well, you know that, there, that it's a little bit of a concept that's been deconstructed. So one aspect is to want to repeat the thing that, that led to that, right? So, so, so that's not necessarily liking it, but that it's, it's motivating to try to repeat it. So one thing that would be key in that sense is that when the animal is not in the square, that it would want to get back into the square in order to, uh, sorry, yeah. If it was not in the square, it would want to go back into the square to reactivate as a drug user would want to repeat the injection or whatever it is. Um, and that, and that, that would be happening, say, I don't know, the mouse is here, and then it runs back in, and then somehow it walks out, et cetera. Uh, I agree with one of your papers, which was on the list of papers. Uh -huh. So uh, I know that you see something, so you do see some slowing down. OK, so let me, yeah, let me, I'm going to get to this. OK, so let me press on, because you may be, I'm just going too slow uh, to, so, OK, so this is, uh, uh, so, this is one of a few papers um, that, that, that came out which uh, tried to, to understand what was going on. So this paper from uh, Rhea Banchi's lab um, compared uh, VTA uh, the transgenic, so the chenrodopsin is expressed in dopaminergic neurons, and uh, this EPET, uh, so this is a, a serotonergic specific promoter, and they failed to replicate this, I, I, this basic effect. So I, here they're not, I think the box is, the, well, it's just this half of the box versus this half of the box. And with the dopamine stimulation, they managed to get the animal to show preference for this half of the box. This is not, by the way, real time. This is a slightly different assay where you first place the animal in one half of the box and you pair, and then later you come back with the full box open and you let the animal run around. So, so there's some relevant differences, but they clearly show a big effect on preference when they stimulate dopamine neurons and they fail to see such an effect when they stimulate DRN neurons. Um, I'm going to show you our, our relevant bit from our lab as well. Um, we also had the like an upper test with self stimulation. They did, yeah. They also saw that, that um, animals would lever press for serotonin stimulation. And they also claim that if they use ser serotonin stimulation, uh, it's even more effective than water rewards in getting animals to learn uh, t to perform. I think it was a like a two choice, two alternative choice task motivated by stimulation, which is which 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 is what you would see typically if you use dopaminergic stimulation. So all this uh, sort of sounds an awful lot like dopaminergic stimulation, and and in fact. Um, the, Without getting too far into the details, if you're interested in this story, please read, for example, this paper, our papers, which I'll get to in a second. The, this, the story that these guys propose is that um, there is actually, within the dorsal raphe, well, it's, it's clear in the dorsal raphe there are not just serotonin neurons, there are neurons with other neurochemical identity. Among those are glutamatergic neurons, most of which are non-serotonergic, although 
perhaps not all of them. And there's a glutamatergic projection to the VTA. There's also a serotonergic projection. And so if the EPET1 promoter was working properly, then these would be the only neurons stimulated. But if the EPET1 actually labeled some uh, of these neurons, then, then you could drive inadvertently dopaminergic neurons instead of serotonergic neurons. And they don't, I think, completely nail that, but they provided a pretty good set of evidence suggesting that, that this is what's actually happening in the Min Min Lo experiment, in the serotonin re reward experiment. So that's cool, interesting, that why is it that, serot that the RAF-A has this subpopulation that can effectively act as a reward? And we shouldn't ignore that, that's pretty interesting, but it seems to, to fail to fail to establish that serotonin itself has actually this sort of rewarding property, if, if you, if you um, buy that. Now I'm gonna show you something that's, so, but then how do we still explain, you know, so, well, can we just simply explain this? Now this is our experiment, but is that all that's going on? Uh, uh, so, so we wanted to, uh, we, we were in the midst of these experiments as I was saying, and uh, we were kind of worried that in fact they were right, and we're always a bit worried about <laughs> when someone sees something different than we do. Um, so we, we actually went ahead and tried to reproduce exactly their experiment, but with our mouse. So our mouse was a cert uh, Cree mouse, not a pet Cree mouse, and it turned out that that may make a, an important difference. So that's a, a kind of lesson. Not all promoters are, are created equally. If you want to get into what I know about it, which I'm not the world's biggest expert, but let, we could talk about that later. Um, it, it, it would be really, I think in my mind, it would be a real disaster to spend like, a num like I don't know, five or 10 years working on the, the CERT promoter only to find out that it was very different than the pet promoter in a, you know, in a way that, uh, that might not be completely relevant. You, you know, so at least, like, you, know, it may, you may say in the end, oh, I don't care. I want to study what's the effect of, of all these neurons firing together. That's also relevant, but you should know at least what, uh, uh, try to know what you're actually doing. Okay, so in our experiment, the thing progresses, the sa is a s similar same as, as the other. So we, whenever the mouse enters this box, we turn on the light so the serotonin neurons get stimulated. I, I think the squares are a little bit dark to see what's happening, but, um, if you compare this bit here to the same bit here, you can see that there's an increase in occupancy similar to what uh, was described. Um, hmm, didn't I say that we failed to reproduce this? So what's going on here? Uh, but then actually you can also see on the post-stimulation day, that seems to be gone. So that's a difference in the data. So we seem to see a place preference here and here growing, and then, but it seems to go away. Um, if we look more carefully though, what we're actually, so what we're seeing is an increase in occupancy. Um, it's quite robust when we, when we quantify it. This is the percentage of time that the animal spends in that little quadrant. But we're not seeing an, any increase in the rate of entries into the square. So that it, this is, you know, the amount of time the animal is, is out of the square, or sorry, the number of uh, times the animal goes into the square divided by the amount of time that he was out of the square, flat. So why is that important? Because a, an, in, a, an index of, um, an, an, an index like this shows that the animal does not seem to care if it's not being stimulated to, to, to achieve that stimulation again. If it's, if it's not being stimulated, then it, then it only enters the box as much as it did before it ever got stimulated. So it doesn't actually seem to have learned anything unless it's in the box being stimulated. If it's outside, it doesn't care. That doesn't sound like reward learning at all, actually. I believe this is 25 hertz stimulation, if I recall correctly. 
and it's on continuously at 25 hertz as, as long as the animal's in the box. So it's pretty simple. Override in what sense? Too much stimulation. Too much stimulation. Oh, oh, why? You mean you're proposing that maybe the problem is too much stimulation? I don't know. I think. Um, we eventually did some dose response curves. So it's a, it's a good point that there could be a U shaped function, as uh, Russian talked about. So yeah, I guess, yeah, if you wanted to say, you wanted to try to explain why we saw something slightly different, you could say either we failed to achieve the same higher, high levels of expression and didn't get enough effect, or I guess you could also say we, we got too much. We were more worried that we didn't get enough. So in our initial experiments, we were not using, so, so this is getting into the details, but if you use a virus like adeno-associated virus AV, they come in many different um, um, sub-strains, um, serotypes. One, two, three, five, blah, blah, blah. And it matters. So different, su different su uh, serotypes express better or worse and spread more or less in different parts of the brain. It's, a, it's kind of a mess. So we switched from the one that we were using, which I believe was 2.1, to the one that they were using, which was 2.9. We got much more expression than we had been getting. We hadn't seen this much at all. We got much bigger effects, so we were happy. We didn't really think that much about what, that we might have actually been stimulating too much. Um, and we we'd still have never seen, actually, in our stimulation studies, we've never seen a, a real U-shaped function yet. We, there, I wouldn't, wouldn't rule it out, but so far we haven't been able to stimulate hard enough to start seeing a loss of, of uh, whatever effect that we'd seen. Uh, there was one question first, I think, further back. No. Uh, yeah? Um, did you worry about um, healing the tissue, the neural tissue, because of the 20 hertz? <sighs> yeah, so early on we were let me think, there's a whole, <laughs> so we spent, uh, we spent a few years, um, <laughs> literally, I don't remember, it was probably a couple, seems like now not so long, but at the time it seemed like a long time, uh, not seeing anything. So we would, you know, remember the, f the first experiment, plugging the mouse in, putting the mouse on the table, uh, turn on the light, you know, we said, the mouse's head didn't explode, yes. <laughs> um, and then we saw a whole series of artifacts. So, we, so there, were, there are all sorts of artifacts that you can see with light. So it turns out if you put an animal in a dark box and then light comes out of its head, sometimes it, it does some, something to respond to that light. There were, et cetera. So yes, there, so we, we worried about that. We made some calculations at some point. We never actually measured it. Um, we, we, you know, it's a, basically the, the critical thing is the duty cycle, or the, well, the, the, the amount of light and the, and the duty cycle. So if, if you're over, if the heat will build, will build relatively slowly. So if you calculate how much time the light is on over, you know, out of each minute, that's, that's kind of the critical thing. So if you want to stimulate at 50 hertz, fine, but don't stimulate at 50 hertz for a minute. Because you, you can get heating with this, these, uh, it, it, isn't, it is a, a potential issue. But at, the, at, the, at these relatively small du smaller duty cycles, it, it doesn't seem to be uh, an issue. So with, for the controls, we, we are always using a YFP, well, we're usually having some in, in, within animal comparison with stimulated and not stimulated, but then we'll have YFP animals which are implanted where you're blind to their genetic identity. So the virus is, is inf they're infected, they're implanted with a fiber, they're stimulated just like the regular animals, and they're, but they just shouldn't be expressing in, in serotonin neurons. So that controls for the heat, heat alone. I think in, if you're studying something where you, you know what you're going to, what you expect, 
you may just dispense with the control because you, I don't know, you'll know how to interpret it. When we were starting these things, we really had no ground truth in our heads, so we thought it was absolutely essential to have, to be blind to the, to the manipulation and to not fool ourselves into thinking that we were, you know, not to fool ourselves. It's very easy to fool yourself subtle, in subtle ways by being biased to say, ah, but that animal, oh, you know, it didn't show anything. Ah, yeah, but I remember, like, that animal didn't get fed last night, so let's throw that animal out. You know, it, you really got to be careful. <laughs> if you don't know, if you're really trying to discover some, something that you, didn't, that you didn't know, you can, you can, you know, you, you can see these, these things get, get, you know, the effects, like, are, are in the good case, the effects are large enough, but there's still animal-to-animal -animal variability, and you can get into trouble. Okay, now there's too many questions. I forget the order, but uh, maybe working from the back to the front, just. Okay, so I'm trying to understand the data. So you said that on the right, um, the number of times were the, the number of times that um, the animals that entered the box or the house of the box was the same across days. That's the only change is the time that occupants. Yeah, so how can the occupancy go up if the rate of entries doesn't go up? Because the rate of exits goes down and the speed goes down. So when they're in the box, they are getting stimulated, they tend to slow down and they don't leave the box. So the occupancy goes up because they don't, they, don't, they, want, to, they want to stay there. Now, but now these two things, it could be that the speed, reducing their speed alone, like if they just can't move, you know, imagine whenever you turn the light on, they're frozen. They're going to show a preference for that location, but it's simply because of a motor effect, for example. We, uh, this, these two things are slightly, are not necessarily one effect. These might be two different effects. It's a little bit complicated to actually tease these apart. So you could imagine, imagine an idealized mouse that has you know, a, a steering wheel and a gas pedal. So the gas pedal um, effect could be the only effect. So if they get just really slow, they, they, you know, they're, they're zipping around, they get into the box, and then they're going to spend more time in the box. But it doesn't affect anything other than their motivation to move. But they may also change their steering, which would be very different conceptually than just slowing down. So they may know that they're in a box or somehow not want to leave as opposed, you know, they may change their steering. That, that would be quite interestingly different. So, and I'm, we couldn't tease those apart from here. Suppose in the onset of the stimulation is rewarding, but if it's prolonged, it becomes aversive and so they freeze. In, uh, could it explain that's this? Common, that's a common result in brain stimulation. The onset is rewarding, but the rat will, turn, will press one lever to turn it on mm. and another lever to turn it off. Mm. Classic result. Mm. So has that been done with optogenetic stimulation? So, the, so you'd want to see it done with varying delay, varying um, durations, basically, or varying intensities. This is chronic, right? Yeah, and these experiments, uh, cro every, for the time that the animal's in the, in the box, so it's on the order of a few seconds. It, could, it varies. The rewards are commonly punctate. Mm -hmm. That's an idea. Mm -hmm. But with this sort of class, so with dopamine stimulation, with, with the experiments I know optogenetically, the pairing, you don't see effects like that very easily with this sort of uh, real-time work. Cocaine can have aversive effects. Now, it can be removed in, but there's a dose of increase of the dopamine effect. Mm -hmm. Can it be slowed down immediately after you start the Yeah, I'll show you that in a second. So I, I, think, yeah, you'll, I think you'll see some of the, the effect we're seeing doesn't look like either version or I'll try to convince you it's neither a version nor, uh, nor a petitive, but, but we'll see if, we're, we're con if it's convincing or not. Um, so I'm assuming that uh, you brought up the point of the cree, uh, pet cree and the cert cree mice being different because 
you don't expect or you don't see uh, gross anatomical differences between the, the expression? expression? There, the, the, the differences are not super obvious, but it, so PET, PET is a transcription factor that is expressed through different stages of development. And so if you look at where is PET expressed in the adult, it's not necessarily labeling all the neurons that were ever expressing PET. So that's one of the complexities. Um, so if you, if you compare Chenrodopsin YFP animals under PET and CERT, I think grossly speaking you wouldn't notice, but if you start combining that with different uh, immuno, uh, immunochemical markers, uh, there is a difference in, uh, in a small population of cells that's labeled by PET but not by CERT. And also uh, in that diagram where you showed that serotonin neurons in the rapid reactivating the dopaminergic neurons, yeah. so there was a connection from glutamate. Yeah. Uh, there was no, there is no connection from the serotonergic to the glutamate in the rapid. Within the rapid, uh, I think there. Well, I don't think that that's those type of experiments, the sort of pathway tracing type of experiments, aren't very easy to to do on local circuits. We're currently doing some in vitro experiments. And I think that the postdoc doing the experiments might have an opinion on that, but I don't have a strong opinion. I, there, there probably are. I think that's one of, our, one of the underdeveloped re areas of, of uh, you know, types of questions is what does the circuitry within the RAFE look like? We know there's prominent auto inhibition, for example, but how do the GABAergic neurons affect the serotonergic neurons? How do the serotonergic neurons affect the GABAergic, the glutamatergic neurons? A lot of the, that work is, is not, there's not much that's, that's known. Um, so if there was a, an aversive stimulus, and additionally, in, in, um, at the same location where they're stimulated, would they still continue to stay? If there were an aversive stimulus, yeah, there's a, if there's an addi like additional like air puff or something that they usually don't like, but yeah. they continue to stay because they're stimulated uh, against their normal uh, response to an aversion. Um, that is... trying to think if we did ever did any experiment that would address that. I don't think anybody has done that experiment, or I'm forgetting if they have. So. It's a, it's a good question. I guess we have not, I don't think per se anyone has looked at that. So I guess you could tell like whether the animals are actually responding as an aversion to the stimulus or uh, to the stimulation or actually like to be there. I mean, you could distinguish that. So, so I thought what you were saying is if, if you had an, an aversive stimulus and then you put on top of it serotonin, it would be sort of masking or, or yeah, they overwrite. Yeah, yeah, it's possible. I don't, I, I don't think that anyone has directly tested that, or that I, or not. I'm not. I guess it depends on the severity of the aversion. If well, I, <laughs> uh, we can speculate. I, I, we can speculate. It may, it may, it might, may do nothing. I mean, I, I don't think we can say anything okay. about that. So right now, okay, let me just, let me, uh, uh, so let, uh, I guess this is just saying, just, so, so just to give you my interpretation for those that got lost somehow in all the, in all the discussion of this, my interpretation of this experiment is, in our, in our version of the experiment, is that there's no learning going on here. All that's happening is that when the animals are being stimulated in a particular region of the box, they slow down, and that's why you see an increase in occupancy. They slow down and or change their steering, um, and that's why this happens from here to here to here, and the reason that you no longer see it here is because it's, there's, nothing, there's no stimulation there, and so they don't, and they don't remember this. The one, once maybe those of you who are noticing may wonder, well then why is this building up? Which, so I, that's not completely clear. But we, this was actually for us a side experiment. This was just to, to reproduce what, the, uh, what the, the other lab had done. We were actually in the midst of doing a different experiment, a couple of different experiments which I want to tell you about. 
and I'll show you more effects. So this is, so I have a bunch more data relevant to this. So if your question has to do with kind of more interpretation of what is going on when you stimulate this, in these type of arenas, then hold your question. But if it has to do with interpreting this, then shoot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, let's go to this side of the room. Yes. The, we, I was describing before, we, we like to use, uh, so they're, they're um, wild type uh, litter mates infected, infected and implanted and stimulated exactly the same and we don't know which are, we don't, we cannot generally tell the difference. Obvi well, until we, in some cases we can start to tell the difference when we stimulate because some of these effects are huge, but, but we're blind in principle. Ah, I'll show you. Uh, For example, uh, maybe the effect of each day uh, is accumulated by a previous day. I'll show. I'll. I. Yeah. So that that seems to be the case. Th this I believe in one. I think one of these measures at least there is a significant difference between from here to here to here for, by one by you know from T1 T2 to T3. But then there. Uh, there you might squint and think, depending on how you did the statistics, that there might even be a lasting difference between this and this, but you'd want to con compare to another group of animals that wasn't stimulated because perhaps on the fourth day there was a change in the amount of time they spend in the middle. So, th so it gets complicated, but yes, there, could, there seems to be perhaps some kind of longer term process going on as well as the immediate process. Okay. Um, the stimulation box, the area where you shine your light, is in the middle of the open field, which yeah. is an aversive place for the mouse anyway. Yeah. So can you actually tell if the net effect over three or four days is aversive or not? Because the mouse might, at the end, I mean, if I ran into a box and got stuck there for three days against my will, then at the end I'd probably want to avoid it. But if before I'd been avoiding that anyway, could you actually tell? So like kind of the baseline is too low. Yeah. But you're, th you're saying, so they're not spending much time in this quadrant, in this bit. So this, the fact that this bar is fairly low is partly because it's, a, it's aversive to be in the, they, they like to be in the walls. And, and when we're stimulating, that is relieved somewhat. The, the version, aversion is, is relieved. Well, or I'm not sure how you're. More that, more that they have to slow down. Why do they have to slow down? Well, just let's just say that the effect isn't aversive or anything else. It's just it slows behavior. Okay, so you, so let's assume that it does do that. Uh -huh. But over the course of three or four days, the learning effect would be aversive. So ah, okay, on like top it, of. They may not like being slowed down. So you're saying, what if there was on top of a slowing downness and aversive? And cumulative aversive. And then, then because this baseline was already low, this couldn't be any lower. Could, it, but it does seem to be actually higher, if anything. So, so, so you might even say maybe there's an appetitive process going on as well as the aversive process. At least in the, in the previous, in these guys' experiment, I don't have the bar graphs, but here they, their, their mouse is showing, if any, well, it's clearly showing that there's some appetitive, now we, we could say that was dopamine, but serotonin on top of that when you use the right mouse, might have an aversive. Okay, yes, could could still be. Uh, okay. I have a very short question. So first, do they look at entry rates and speeds? No. And the second one, uh, do you do this for the longer times? So not just two days, but if you do this for a longer time. I'll show you. Okay. Good do question. You know what the, these mice were doing when they slow? Because maybe. They were slow and start sniffing to look after the board and then and its effect of you know I feeling better so good it's yeah it's something here that I feel uh, better and where is it so we so le yeah so we address so let me get let me uh, 
I w actually want to skip this because it takes too long to describe and we're relatively, yeah, I'm going to skip that. S s this, is an exp this is published if you're interested. This is a, an attempt to, to use a more precise task with, where the animal makes a choice and to see whether serotonin influences the choice to the left or the right and it doesn't. And I don't have time to, to explain it, but we're, we're, we, uh, we can talk about it if you're interested. But here's, here, I want to get back to this open field stuff. So we've been talking now conceptually about two different types of effects, like your question was very much like, what if there's a direct effect and a learning effect? So in the Min Min Lo study and the way we think about dopamine, we're thinking that there's, there's this kind of learning that can go on resulting in these persistent changes, and then there's direct effects. So there can be both at the same time, and they can interact even in some ways. So, so we, we were thinking about this, but what we ended up thinking is it's actually mostly this that's going on, and we were just a bit confused between what was, what was happening. So this is what we were seeing in, in when we did the experiment. So we were not doing, we were not thinking conditioning. I think, actually, I don't remember originally why we, were, why we do this. We don't typically do open field experiments, but this is the sort of, this is the thing we found when we, when we switch to this uh, AV19, which, is, which is, gives you pretty, pretty strong expression. So this is the wild type control infected and implanted and stimulated, and this is the cert Cree animal. So the, you can see the lines are stimulation epochs. So the stimulation is on, I believe it's five, well, you can see from here. It's uh, four seconds, and, and, it, and we repeat a tr a f four seconds on, and I believe it's 10 seconds off, then four seconds on and 10 seconds off for uh, five minutes, and then five minutes of nothing, and then five minutes like this, and the session is 30 minutes. And this is a huge effect in every animal. So this is, this is more or less a drop of 50 plus percent that happens with a small delay, but you know, reaches a peak within almost a second. So it's extremely fast at the behavioral level, and it relaxes back or, or, or goes back to baseline also fairly quickly, a little bit more slowly. Um, so this is the slowing effect. This is what I would call direct effect. So there, there seems to be each time you repeat this goes goes from this baseline down to uh, down to a, 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 a much lower level, and that's what we think accounts for most of what we're seeing in the in the square. And it's not freezing. Right. So I d so. If you look at this paper, I don't have the slide. I don't have all the slides for this, but and this was getting to I think your question. So if you start looking at the animals, what are they actually doing when you stimulate? So they're not freezing, so they still display small small movements. They uh, all of the active movements that you could that that. So we did this by using some sort of manual ethogram. Approach, you know, manual, e, uh, what's the right word? Ethogrammography, I'm, I'm missing the correct, the, the, the correct word, but we classified what the mouse was doing with reasonable resolution, and we said, is it jumping, is it scratching, is it sniffing, is it digging, uh, resting quietly, and all of the active behaviors like rearing or jumping or running, or walking were reduced, and the the more passive behaviors were either not affected or perhaps enhanced. Um, if you, <laughs> but if you look at what if you look at it, what you sometimes see that I don't know how to explain actually what it is, but they they sometimes seem to basically kind of go like, kind of look down a little bit like when it, at the initiation. So, so it sort of looks like they notice something, um, but that's pr somewhat transient, and uh, 
they could continue either manipulating something or like they, they may be digging or something like that. That can continue, but they will not, if, if they're moving, this is another slide I don't have, but you can, we, we, we did a lot of analysis, a, a, quite a lot of analysis of does it matter if they're at the walls? Uh, does it matter uh, how fast they're moving when, it, when you stimulate? Does it affect whether they go toward the center or stay in the center? Does it, and, and none of these things are, are uh, none of these things seem to be important. So, it, so in this condition in the open field, it doesn't matter whether they're where they are or how fast they're moving to first, to first approximation. The effects are actually um, bigger when they're moving faster, but there's also an effect if they're moving slower. It doesn't matter where they are, et cetera. So, so it's, 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 we were hoping to see something that would give us a clue about what kind of bias it was causing or whether it was, it does not cause or relieve thigmotaxis. So, so there's no change in the distance of the animal from the wall. It neither makes them hug the wall, nor does it make them less likely to be uh, at the wall. So it, so it does not seem to be affecting at least uh, how one measures anxiety in the open field. We, we didn't test other measures of anxiety, but um, it, it doesn't seem to be affecting uh, affecting that in, in, this, in this assay. Okay, uh, back there. A resting mouse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were hoping to see something interesting like it, it would prevent movement initiation but would not stop already moving or the other way around, but it, it, it affects moving mice and it also prevents mice that are not moving from starting. Some of these things, yeah, there may be small bits that were missing, but, but it do, do, do didn't seem to do that. But I'll, show you, but, in a, but I'll show you in a slightly different context that it, it does become relevant whether the mouse is doing something or not. It just doesn't, in the open field though, do, doesn't seem to matter. Suppose the mouse is asleep. Mm, does what happens? I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, we, at some point, were we're looking at whether you could wake them up or not, this kind of thing. We, we, I don't know whether, I don't know. We didn't do it very carefully. I just one comment, because it's fascinating, because after MDMA, uh, we observed, in my, me and my friends, in, after MDMA, uh, we've got increased locomotor activity, but after around two hours, we have seen stereotypy. They took um, food or something and keep in, their hands and scratching and uh, eating or something like this. So huh. it's kind of stereotypy, I think. It's, it's fascinating. Could, interesting. Huh. But not initially. Yes, not initially. So initially, initially hyper low? And, uh, yes. And after, uh, so something happened maybe with CERT or something like this. But after MDMA, you've got... Well, so you presumably, or you, I, what's your idea? Do you think that you initially have a very high level and then it, it comes back down? So that's why you see two different sorts of effects? Um, we measure dopamine, so we think that it's because dopamine effect. Okay, yeah. Huh. I will send you from this picture. Yeah, I'd like <laughs> to see that. Um, you and you. For, uh, one. Um, so in this figure, mm. doesn't it look like uh, the white type has a preference for the walls, but that preference is gone in the surf cream mouse once you turn on the light? Uh, wait, wait, where? So in the white type, the um, mouse Here? in the, the white type. The wild type. Oh, wild wild type, type, yeah. The mouse is running along the walls uh, quite a bit as they are prone to doing in open field tests. But in the search Cree mouse, uh, that preference seems to be gone. Ah. Um, I see, you mean not, not during stimulation, but just from the, so I, that, I do not 
So I do not think that that is the case, but I agree in this particular pair, it does look to be the case. So um, I will have to look at the paper to remember or ask Patricia Correa whether she compared <laughs> the background. So it is conceivable that the genetic background makes a difference to their anxiety. But why that would be, would be, I'm not sure what, why, but, and why it wouldn't interact with stimulation, but it, it's, it's not inconceivable. But I don't think it was overall the case. I think it's just a bad example, but. And but, uh, one more question. So in certain um, reward-based tasks, uh, the animal sort of learns certain superstitious behaviors. For example, if it thinks that in the center it's getting a reward, not only does it always go to the center, it always takes the same path mm -hmm, mm -hmm. while going to the center. Mm -hmm. And in the uh, first paper, in the pet cream mouse that you showed, you could see kind of certain paths which the mouse was taking quite mm -hmm. frequently. Mm -hmm. But in your uh, mouse, mm -hmm. um, it didn't seem to be the case. Mm -hmm. I mean, they still spent a lot of time in the corners, mm -hmm. uh, but those <coughs> superstitious uh, paths mm -hmm. were not there. Mm -hmm. So that would be, so if it's dopaminergic effect, then, and, our, and we're not stimulating dopamine, then that would be consistent with, with what you're saying. We didn't analyze that very, we didn't analyze that per se, but I th that seems like a reasonable observation. They also didn't quantify that, as far as I know. Qu question? Yeah. No idea. So, so Ru Russian brought, brought that up in, the, in a general sense. There might be different optimal amounts for different tasks, and uh, we certainly haven't addressed that, but it's a good question. Um, I mean that with um, um, following the stimulation, when the effect uh, is reversed in this test? What do you mean by reversed? You mean after it relaxed, like here, or, yeah. or in the fourth day after? Well, we let me. Sh I'll show you. I'll show you something very quickly. I think in the next couple slides about long-term effects. That maybe we'll get into that, but I'm not sure. I don't think I can address what you're asking directly. Yeah, well, With what? Yeah. Ah, yeah, so you, you could measure. That's, yeah, in, in principle, yes. So in my, so in my, <laughs> in my lab, we, we have been, uh, we have been um, ridiculously unsuccessful in microdialysis. We had a collaboration uh, uh, to do microdialysis, which didn't, which worked out absolutely horribly, so we don't have any microdialysis results, but it uh, would be quite nice to have. Okay. It, We, uh, great, we, yes, yes. So in this, we haven't done any pharmacology on this particular task. In some, uh, if, in, am I gonna get, I'm gonna get to, if I get through the slides, I will show you another task where we've done a little bit of pharmacology and we have seen effects of 5-HT2C and 2A which actually um, comes really from work from Trevor's lab that, that identified those receptors. We see something that's quite, quite consistent with that. But in this context, in the slowing, we, we haven't done the pharmacology. So I could speculate, but I'm not, I'm not sure. It, it may be the, that the, so if I had to guess, I would say, yeah, 2C and 2, 2A probably have effects, probably are mediating this effect. We have two more slides and then a break. Okay. Uh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> Are you keeping track? I'm on it. Twenty-two. I'm still behind. They are information prevalence, direct stimulation, but then after stimulation, the most likely don't have to be Yeah. Have you tried that after that to make them from the No. Okay. No. Like some latent inhibition or some. I don't know. I, I figured if they forgot about that, I knew. Uh, or, or. And, and 
ideas of, or the direct effect is actually the cause of face preference, then I would figure that if you would stimulate them later and put them in place, that they would also push them to that place. The second place or the first yeah. place? The second place. Huh. Why? Why? Because then the direct effect would be slow locomotion over there. Oh, oh, you, you mean you'd see the same? You'd see the the same as the first one. Yeah, yes, I agree. But we, we haven't done it. But I agree. I would expect it would. We could redo it in many places. We may have done that informally, uh, just to check. But and it and it was as we expected. But I. But we don't have real data on that. But I. That's what I would expect too. Okay, last question, then I'll try to do, I'll try to pick one, one or two slides before we um, finish. So there's a paper uh, from Carter uh, quite a while back ago. He did uh, auto activation of the Lucas Aurelius. And they also start in a uh, second time scale uh, with continuous light behavioral arrest. And I think they describe it to medical depletion, neurotransmitter depletion. Uh, depletion of norepinephrine. Yeah, due to the I don't think that's what's going on, but I couldn't, but not because of this experiment, <coughs> excuse me, not because of this experiment, <coughs> but I would expect if, if there was something, I, I don't, know, don't know the study, so and I, don't, I guess I shouldn't, but wouldn't you expect to see at least some initial Opposite effect? Yeah, initially they start. Oh, that's effect. how they see it? Yeah, if they do continuous light for a few seconds, then only then they see uh, behavioral arrests. Huh. I should, I'll, I, can you, I'd like to, s well, I probably can find it, but if you give me the reference, I'd like to look at it. But we, so we've not seen, you know, if you look, we, we see this very monotonic, very linear sort of effect, at least under the parameters of the, the, the sort of amounts and rates of stimulation. We haven't seen any inverted U's. I don't, not that they are, they, they may be there, but, but at least we haven't explored widely enough to see. So I think we've explored at least the lower range, but we may be missing the upper range. It might be that we fail. If you look in a slice and you, and you well, it's not perfect, perfect recapitulation of the in vivo situation, but if you look in a slice, actually or anesthetized animals and you try to measure as you do uh, stimulation at increasing frequencies, what's the effective frequency that you're driving the neurons, you, you saturate at some point. You can't drive them beyond, you can't drive them at 100 hertz. But if you're stimulated at 100 hertz, what you end up getting is, you know, you, you, as you go up 1, 5, 10, you, you keep getting effectively more output, but it saturates. So you, you at least in our hands, you, that could explain why, or let, that's one of the features that would explain why we don't see a drop off. Uh, but different, if you switch to a different type of channel rhodopsin, you might see something slightly different if you had a faster channel rhodopsin. So, could, you, could get all, you could get into complexities. We may have gotten lucky that we happened to be in a regime where we just slowly increase things and we can only get that far. Uh, does raise it, you know, and, and of course, no one, no one has brought this up so far, but how, how, you know, what's the right frequency? What's the endogenous frequency? Uh, is it 10 hertz, 50 hertz? Are we doing something that's physiologically relevant? We are synchronizing a bunch of neurons. Is that relevant? So, so, there are, so the optogenetics, you, we, we can map it out in detail in principle, but that doesn't, well, that can help us to understand what might be going on in different conditions endogenously, but we're always left with some possibility that we're doing something a bit artificial. That's a, that's a caveat for all these. So let, so, uh, <laughs> Let me remind you that, that dopamine, uh, as, as has been discussed, is involved in somewhat the opposite direct effect, so it can boost or, or invigorate movement, hence the involvement between dopamine and Parkinson's. Here we're seeing something that looks like the opposite, uh, 
So here is a dopamine serotonin opponency that we're suggesting where serotonin seems to slow down movements opposite to dopamine, which tends to speed them up. So you could think of the direct effect as devigoration. And then I'll say this, I'll do this quickly in the, uh, and then it'll be a great place to break. So some people ask about long-term effects, and I think this was the most interesting thing that we found in this study because we had no idea that uh, we would see it, and we, so we do see a long-term effect. The reason we were doing this experiment was to control for things that might be changing over time, like expression of the, of the virus might increase or decrease the effect, you know, the amount of, of chenorhodopsin, which could affect how much serotonin is being released, or the familiarity with the box or something else that takes place as the animal goes along. So we had animals that were placed in the box for 24 days without being stimulated, and then on day 24, they began to be stimulated, and then another group that received the, day, the stimulation that I've been describing every day. So they're getting 15 minutes, three five-minute bouts of stimulation, where within the five minutes, it's, I think, four seconds on, 10 seconds off, repeated. So it's a total, actually, if you, if you calculate the amount of stimulation and you use some kind of baseline, assume each neuron was firing at one hertz or something, and then we added this, this additional boost. The, the boost is, say, a few percent, five, 10 percent at most, of what the, what the serotonin neurons would have been doing if the animal had never been stimulated. So it's not like we're whacking the animal uh, overall. In, you know, in the short time scale, yes, but overall, we're not really doing all that much. So what, what, what happens? So this is, um, this is the control animals, and we're just plotting the speed, average speed in, across sessions. And this is the right before the stimulus comes on, and then right after the stimulus comes on. So that would be, oops, pre would be this, and post would be this. So because these animals are not being stimulated, of course, pre and post you have to be the same, or they should be the same, and they are. And then when we start stimulating, you see this drop. So this is baseline and then the effect of stimulation. So this is as we would, as we would expect, uh, not too surprising. And this is the group that receives stimulation every day. So if you look at day one, you see the drop. So this is the effect I've been showing. And if you look at day 24, you see the same drop. But what's going on that we missed initially for, for, for a very long time is that the two groups start off at, say, six centimeters per second. But by the end of this 24 days, these animals are at eight or nine centimeters a second in the baseline, whereas these animals are still at, at six. So there's actually an increase in the baseline of a quite substantial increase that's going on that seems to be uh, adding to the, the immediate effect of stimulation. So these animals, having been stimulated for 24 days, are now moving much faster than these animals. And it doesn't matter whether we're stimulating on that day, or it's at least carrying over from the previous day, because you can measure this in the first five minutes that the animals are in the box in which they're not stimulated at all, and they're still moving faster than the corresponding group here. So there is some kind of long-term effect that's building up over days that's opposite to the direct effect. So the direct effect is a drop in speed. The long-term effect is an increase in speed. And as far as we can tell, it seems to be growing over two to three weeks and, um, and doesn't, see, doesn't seem to be uh, a direct rebound from, from stimulation, but rather something that's, that's changing in the background. So although there is a difference between 
there is still in Kimberley, there is still a tendency to increase in control, right? In session, in last session. So there is still a tendency. It's, it's, it means You're talking about this versus this? Yes. I mean, I just compared it to the, the last session. So we would, so I, I don't think we could, I don't think you could, it's statistically we couldn't see it, but you would expect as soon as we start stimulating, this is already four sessions, then this should be growing just like this was. So here in the first couple sessions there, there isn't, but maybe by the end of the third or fourth, they're already starting to show that. Because this is control, this is not wild type, this is just... Are you talking about you're talking about here or here? Just here, yes, the last the blue one. Yeah. This. So you're so maybe I'm not understanding the question. So you're saying you're wondering if these if they're also showing a slow increase? Yeah, but they should, right? Yeah. Well they have to. Well, they almost have to because I mean, well they don't have to, but our, I'm presuming my interpretation of the data is that that each time you stimulate something in addition to the direct effect, there's either a direct learning effect, let's call it plasticity of some kind, or the direct effect itself interacts with some other process. So for example, perhaps there's some dopamine dependent learning going on which in the, somehow in the control groups just doesn't amount to anything. And when you do the stimulation, you release or, or enhance the dopaminergic learning effect. So, there's, so there, there can be an, a consequence of the serotonin stimulation, uh, the, 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 the direct effect, or there could be a second pathway, so to speak, that causes something. But we would expect to see, as soon as we start the, the treatment here, the same process as you would see here, right? So these four days, unless this effect, this did something, I would expect these four days to be the same as these four days. So you should be able to start seeing within a four to eight days, you should start to see this. It's just, it's small each day, so it's hard without carrying it out for a while to, to sort of, to see it accumulating. Did you check if this effect is because of excitotoxicity or neuronal loss? Uh, no. Um, Could they explain the effects? But, one, but if it was excited toxicity or neuronal loss, then how would you explain the fact that this primary effect is, is, is equal? So the, the amount of effect here and here and here yeah, is the same. So, like so just join at some point. Yeah, yeah so we, yeah. it's no. possible because, you know, we, we actually... Perhaps we should, we should check. So we're actually following this up now, so, we, so it's useful to hear what experiments you would like to do, but, so we should check that. But it seems hard to yeah. explain with that. Should we break? We should break. Great, let's break. <laughs>